My name is Eric Wahlberg. I'm the uh, CEO and co-founder of Prophetic. So, um, Prophetic, um, we are a, a, a non-invasive consumer neurotech company. Um, to start, I kind of want to talk about why consumer neurotech really hasn't hit its stride, right? Um, it's not exactly fusion like 30 years away at all times, but uh, it, it, it also has not really been delivered. So, of course, you have invasive and minimally invasive BCIs, um, which people are very excited about, but of course there are you know, regulatory safety concerns and an uncanny valley uh, issue. Like even if you were to satisfy the regulatory and, and safety concerns, um, I think people are very excited about something like Neuralink. I think it's a, a, an entirely different thing, like when you're under the surgical robot, uh, you know, how you feel about getting that. Um, you also have neural feedback, uh, you know, uh, uh, content games, etc. cetera. Um, companies like Muse and Mendy, which were kind of pioneers in the field, um, the issue there really has been that uh, people haven't been able to generalize, uh, you know, both algorithmically and, and, and with content, you know, across, uh, you, know, you know, large populations of people. So you purchase a Muse or a Mendy, um, and they maybe have content that are, you know, is aiming to get you into a meditative state. You kind of try it for a week or two. It doesn't really have the effect, and and you kind of you know desist with using it. My joke here is like, why is Ozempic flying off the shelves and not gym memberships? Um, and, and the reason is is that you know people, you know, human behavior, consumer behavior, we want things given to us. Um, now that brings you to non-invasive neuromodulation. Um, you have trans, uh, you have an electrical simulation, direct current, alternating current. And, and, and we really internally call these the, the kind of vacuum tubes of non-invasive neurosimulation. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about why that is, but primarily it's about depth, precision, and, and ability, the lack of the ability to steer it. But then the question you have to ask yourself is, if you were to satisfy all three of these you know, uh, you know, issues, if you could do uh, non-invasive neuromodulation, um, what would be the experience that you would go to market with? Like, what would be the experience that has a K factor that is non-trivial? Like, if you delivered an experience to somebody that would change their life and the way that they view things forever, and the answer for that, uh, for us, is the induction of lucid dreams. Now, a little bit about lucid dreams. Um, and again, you could watch Yosha Box talks on this as well. Um, but lucid dreams, uh, you know, we kind of call it the ultimate reality interface. Um, now, to define our terms here, we're talking about the neural correlates being prefrontal cortex activation during REM, right? So when you're in regular REM or, or you know, a regular dream, your prefrontal cortex is quiet if not off. Your prefrontal cortex is where your conscious awareness, decision making, working memory are. Um, it's why in a regular dream you can go from playing in the Super Bowl to being in the Hall of Mirrors in Versailles and you're just like, yeah, okay, for sure. Um, but uh, by the way, show of hands, who's had a, who knows what a lucid dream is? Good. Who's had a lucid dream? Okay, that, that about math. About 55% of people self-report having had a lucid dream at least once in their life. And, and really what we're talking about here, right, is the awareness in, that, that you're in a dream that begets the control of the phenomenological contents of that dream at will. Um, and the, and the things that people do in their lucid dream dreams are, is kind of endless. Um, what you imagine becomes. It's kind of the ultimate VR experience. Uh, you can fly. You can sleep with that person that you wanted to. You can make buildings appear out of the ground. You can talk to you know your dream characters. That could be a deceased relative of yours. You know so on and so forth. And you can use it for productive ends. We have investors who code in their dreams and run the code in the morning. Uh, the guy who did the first render of our hardware is a fashion and hardware designer named Case Fenley who designs in his lucid dreams. Um, so it's this kind of interface by which uh, creativity, recreation, um, and, and profound metaphysical uh, you know, experiences are, are, are possible. I'll give you a very concrete example of metaphysical you know, potency. I lost my grandmother a couple years ago. She lived to be 98. Wonderful you know, life. All good. Um, what do you think the first thing I did when I had a lucid dream was? I went and talked to my grandmother. Right? I was getting married at the time. And you know, what's great is like, you, know, you have a mental model of, of a person. right? So I have a mental model of my grandmother. Um, and what's really great is these, <laughs> these dream characters, mental you know, representations of, of, of people that you know, they're not just going to you know, talk to you the way you wish that they would talk to you. Like my grandmother was lovely and she loved me, but she was very judgmental. And so like they're still going to kind of respond to you in the way that that person would. Um, how do we do this? So we marry two core technologies, transcranial focused ultrasound um, and neural transformers. So, we, we, we heard from Sumner about minimally invasive ultrasound. One of the, you know, the, the three core benefits of, of ultrasound versus magnetic or electrical stimulation uh, is one, precision. So you're talking about millimeter level resolution. Depth, you're talking about getting centimeters into the brain, non-invasively, no problem. And then, of course, is the ability to steer it in three dimensions. Uh, 
so very important because you know your brain fires in three-dimensional neural firing patterns. You can even get to the point where you can do acoustic holograms. Now, neural transformers are, are a really important part of this um, because you need to be able to model uh, the neuroimaging data uh, that you're collecting uh, output in the form of voxels, targets for the neuromodulation, and have a closed-loop system that's constantly uh, you know, iterating. Um, and so you can create generative ultrasound sequences of pulses. Um, again, I'm just going to race through this because we're, we're really not, I, I really want to get to just the salon. This is the prototype we, uh, of the Halo, the consumer device that we're looking to build. We started with this. Um, one of our advisors is Sterling Crispin, who's, who led Apple's neurotech prototyping team for the Vision Pro. And one of the things that he says that they do in, in, internally at Apple is when you're looking to build a novel uh, you know, device, you really want to start with a design prototype which you use as kind of a forcing function when you're building your technical prototype. So, you know, the, the, the headband, you know, had four ch only four channels of, of EEG and two ultrasound transducers. Today we use a 32 channel system and, and we're working on, you know, two, four, um, and soon 640 element uh, transducer systems. Um, but, but, but again, we use this design prototype as a, as a form factor to understand what is the most comfortable, ergonomic, and beautiful, uh, you know, device that we could possibly build. We also, by the way, did this with Card79 who's the ID firm that did uh, Neuralink for Elon. Um, this is Morpheus One. I'm, I'm, there's a 10 minute video that you can watch, um, but I'm just gonna skip uh, to a, a part where we're actually demoing it. Um, so here, um, you're seeing on the left uh, a, a, an EEG, okay? And on the right, you're seeing a sequence of ultrasound pulses. And what you're gonna see me do is I'm gonna run the code and what's happening is you just saw the EEG shift, so it got a, a, an input. The thing that's prompting the model is the EEG, and you're seeing that list of, uh, of voxels, um, those three, you know, three, uh, three commas indicating targets, and then you see the targets update. And so you're seeing kind of how the transformer uh, takes neuroimaging data, and this model, by the way, is pre-trained on simultaneous EEG fMRI data. We have a collaboration with the Donders Institute, which is led by Dr. Martin Dressler, who whose work actually in fMRI established the neural correlates of lucid dreaming. Um, and so you're just going to see me continue to cycle through. But, but again, what we're talking about is having the headband use both EEG. We're actually working on FNIRs as well. That's taking the neuroimaging data in real time from you, OK? And then it shifts and then outputs the targets for the neuromodulation. And it's constantly basically looking for, uh, you know, to, to create this prefrontal cortex activation. To run you through how this would work, right, is you'd put the headband on, you'd go to sleep. What's your name? Angie? OK, Angie puts this on, she goes to sleep. The first thing that the model is looking for is, has Angie entered REM? Once Angie's entered REM, that triggers the model to send out the first pulse of TFUS. And once that's happened, it's looking for the EEG signature, and then soon again, the, uh, the FNIR signature of lucidity, which are these gamma frequency spikes indicating high neuronal activity in the prefrontal cortex. So basically, the model's like, is Angie in REM? Is she in REM? Is she in REM? Great, she's in REM. Is she lucid? Is she lucid? Oh, great, she's lucid. Let's keep her lucid. Let's keep her lucid. She's not in REM anymore. Let's turn off. So it gives you a sense of how the system is in its closed loop system, constantly iterating, looking for the pulses of TFUS that, that get her to that lucid state. This is just an overview. We do everything in-house. Um, so we could have purchased a research-grade ultrasound machine for like $320,000. It would have taken them three months to build. Or we could do everything ourselves. Um, and basically, when you're a venture-backed company and you're looking to do hardware, you should do everything yourself. Um, so we design our own transducers in-house. Now, we don't pick those, trans those designs from the ether. We use previously done induction research as inputs to those designs. We built our own ultrasound simulation software in something called K-Wave, which is a, a language that allows you to model the physics of wave propagation. We produce these transducers in-house. Um, everything from the machine layer uh, to, the, you know, uh, you know, to the various kind of material science things that were required for building a transducer. To give you a sense, uh, the, the top single element transducer, that one transducer, if you were to purchase that, it would be $1,000. I have a, at the office a wall of probably 50 transducers hanging up that is probably well less than $1,000 of materials. So we also lower the cost of, of producing these transducers by doing it in-house. You're also seeing a three config there at the bottom. Now, once you manufacture something, Okay, it's one thing to simulate something, it's another thing to produce it. How do you know that what you manufactured is what you simulated? And that's where the hydrophone, a 3D scanline hydrophone tank comes in, we call that Moses. And basically, there's a three-dimensional axle steering system, you probably really can't see it there. There's a, a 5,000 hour hydrophone needle there. And you fill this up with deionized water, you submerge your transducer, and you do a, a, a scan where the transducer is moving on a plane and building what you see there on the right, which is a pressure scan. 
and you compare that pressure scan with what you've simulated. I can't see how ultrasound goes through your brain. I'd have to kill you and I don't want to do that. But what I can do is create a pressure scan, compare that with what we've simulated, and then input a CT scan and see how the waves propagate through the skull and then to the brain. So to give you a sense, we can go from designing a transducer to simulating it, to producing it, to testing it, and to using it in 48 hours. So it allows us to rapidly prototype and, 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 and iterate. And I, I want to just highlight, yeah, we use them. So we dog food our own transducers um, internally. And we do things like replicate previously done research by people like Dr. Jason Guetti, who's targeting of the dorsolateral prefrontal into cortex, which is you know, partially responsible for elevating mood, or, or we do focus. Uh, we've also done a lot of things that we would never do on people like you, like alter our smell or, or, or things like that. Um, but yeah, we do everything internally. Again, you're seeing here just this closed loop system, um, but actually here's a video kind of showing you this. It's a very quick video, so I might play it a few times. But what you're seeing here, okay, is the system kind of hooked up, uh, waveform generator, oscilloscope, et cetera. You're seeing kind of our, our UI UX. Um, I'm gonna pause it right there. So you're seeing kind of the th 32 channels of EEG, that, that's that cool kind of blue uh, you know, visualization. You're seeing, the, again, that map that was familiar from the Morpheus demo. Uh, where you're seeing the channels uh, showcasing you know, the, the, the activity of the prefrontal cortex, and then you're seeing a, a, a power spectral density map. So the input, again, is the EEG, okay, here. And then you're gonna see the voxels, targets, be produced. Now, you can't hear this, but you're, if, you, if I had the volume on, you would hear the pulsing and so on and so forth update, both temporally, and then if I had a visualization of it, it would be spatially. So, that closed loop system is operational today, um, where we can actually, again, look for these gamma frequency spikes. And if we're looking at things like uh, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, it's a closed loop system looking to elevate your mood. Or if we're just trying to increase the activity in the prefrontal cortex to create something like focus, that's how this all works. Now, the difference, again, uh, for lucidity is you're increasing that prefrontal cortex activity while you're in REM. Now, the next step of what we're going to be doing is sleeping with this. We have a mattress in our office. Um, and so, uh, you know, the EEG, again, looking for that REM, turning on, uh, activating the Mor Morpheus model, sending out the first pulse of TFUS, and constantly iterating to find those uh, pulses that, that increase that uh, gamma frequency in the prefrontal cortex, thus indicate, uh, inducing a state. This is just a little bit on the next phase of where we're at. So you saw we have a, a single element transducer system where we had been previously just doing analog targeting using an EEG map for, like, for example, like the F8 is where your dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is. Um, you saw a three config. We're now, again, onboarding that 32-channel EEG system in the model. But the next phase of this is, is quite, quite different. Um, so on the right, you're seeing a production of, uh, of our ultrasound boards. Uh, this is a design that we built off of an open source design from a, a firm called Open Water. Um, and this, this system, this, this board, uh, has 128 channels that you can, or 128 elements. You can think about, by the way, an element, okay? An ultrasound transducer is a piece of piezoelectric material. When you run electrical current through that piezoelectric material, it oscillates, creating the ultrasonic wave. Okay, so we have a single element transducer. The issue there is that if you want to steer that beam, you have to mechanically move it. But if you have a multi-element uh, you know, system, so let's say uh, 49 uh, elements, so you want it to be a square, and you have it arrayed in columns, so a phased array, you would pulse the first column, okay, let's say, and then the second column a few microseconds later, and then so on and so forth, and maybe you move it to the right or to the left or up and down, so you can phase steer it. Um, and the board allows us to run up to 640 element systems, okay, so it's a big you know, jump from the single element transducer or the three or five single element configs that we're doing today to 640 elements. And then the thing on the right is actually really, honestly, in my opinion, very beautiful. So um, we actually array, create the arrays in Fibonacci sequences, Fibonacci spirals, because it maximizes the steering range and the ability for uh, acoustic calligraphy. So you're just going to see here um, a simulation of that. So you're going to see the beam form in the center, and then you're going to see it move in phase, for example, there to the right. Um, so I just think it's a beautiful thing that something like Fibonacci sequences are actually the optimal way to, to phase steer ultrasound. Um, okay, this is what we're here to talk about. Um, we're gonna rearrange the chairs to do like a salon where I guess we're sitting in groups. So I posted in the Telegram chats the article that we're gonna be talking about. I'm gonna describe it here, but while we're maybe rearranging things, if you wanna give it a read, that, that'd be great. Um, so 
the quality of takeoff, uh, you know, in the age of spiritual machines is really a piece that I, I, I wrote as like kind of a vision for the future. Um, so the piece starts by asking the question of if we have neural transformers and we're actually able to model, um, you know, uh, you know, neuronal firing, firing, firing patterns and, and, and brain states in, in neural transformers, we can move from the current paradigm, which is the neural correlates of a conscious state into model correlates of a current state. And, and the thing that's really great about that is, um, unlike uh, you know, neural correlates of, of a conscious state, you can pair models right, with perturbational technologies like ultrasound. So you can actually see, right, okay, if I built a model um, of, uh, that has the, you know, uh, a, model, a neural transformer model on neuro, uh, neuroimaging data of lucid dreams, how do I know that it actually understands what a lucid dream is or actually understands the spatial temporal neural firing patterns of a lucid dream? Well, it's because I can pair it with a, an ultrasound you know, system and it produces that brain state. So you actually validate that the model understands, um, you know, actually has a, a, a model correlate of that conscious state. Um, and, and you'll see in the, in the piece, I kind of, I take this very far, I mean, everything from also thinking about interpretability engineering in this context, where as you have more and more uh, neural transformers of more and more you know, brain states, the paradigm of interpretability engineering, which we use to try to understand, right, what is a model actually doing, you know, the black box of a transformer architecture, for example, where we could actually kind of probe these neural transformer models to find you know, mathematical principles uh, related to consciousness, generalizations, and so on and so forth. Um, and then you'll also see that I, I talk about these kind of two different paths uh, to maybe finding a, a theory of consciousness. The first I call, you know, the Darwins of consciousness. Um, what did Darwin do, right? He goes on the HMS Beagle, he goes to the Galapagos, uh, he looks at a bunch of finches, I'm oversimplifying, right? And he derives one of the most foundational, you know, theories of reality that we have, you know, the theory of, of evolution by natural selection. So the question is, is, okay, a lucid dream is this kind of, it's like a Galapagos Island. It's, I call it the particle accelerator for consciousness. It's this brain state, right, where it, it's a conscious experience with little to zero sensory data and you're, you know, but you're able to generate, you know, novel conscious experiences and qualia. What if you, you know, who could be the, you know, the Darwin of consciousness? or Darwins of consciousness, the people who kind of do what Darwin did, to sit and observe and see if they cannot derive some, some found, fundamental kind of observation uh, that leads to a theory of consciousness. And then again, uh, you know, there's also the direction of interpretability. Um, and, and, and then what I kind of end on is this kind of concept of a quality takeoff scenario, uh, kind of obviously done in parallel to the concept of, of the AI takeoff scenario, which is when you think about a lucid dream, the, the combinatorial nature of a lucid dream in terms of qualia is you know, relative to our waking state consciousness, quite large. For example, right, um, in a lucid dream that I've had, you know, I've, pr I've been like, okay, I want to create a building. I want to generate a building. And, you know, I've, I've experienced where it's like, the building is made of a material that is not even like a, me like a meta material or anything that like exists in reality. It's, it's got this weird quality. So the qualia or the nature of that, you know, material doesn't exist in waking state consciousness. So the number of kind of qualia and conscious experiences you can have in a lucid dream is much larger than that uh, as you can have in a waking state consciousness. Because when we're in a waking state, right, basically what's happening is, you know, you're observing a scene, your sensory organs are taking in data, you're, uh, you know, predicting over that and you're choosing an action. It's a very reactive process. But what we're talking about here is a generative process, uh, certainly in the context of lucid dreaming, and then in the context of this technology as it improves, where we can generate conscious experiences on demand. And so, you know, we've been in a quality of takeoff scenario, by the way, for quite some time, right? 500 years ago, our ancestors had a very limited number of conscious experiences that you could possibly have. I had a conversation with a guy named Bern Hobart, who said, you know, Eric, do you know why stained glass windows were so extraordinary in, in Gothic Europe? And I was like, I mean, tell me. And he said, to a, to a peasant in, in Gothic Europe, a stained glass window was like the most psychedelic thing that you would, you know, that person would ever experience. But today, you know, we can hop on a plane and go to Tokyo. And that's a you know, novel, you know, conscious experience. Um, we can, you know, we, we have screens now, right, where we can, you know, watch Netflix, and now we have generative AI. And so the number of qualia that we can experience is already increasing. But with this technology, and certainly things like the induction of lucid dream states, uh, we can expect that to only increase. And then when you imagine, uh, if you grant me that these two paths that I've briefly elucidated, but have expounded on in, in greater detail in the piece, um, if you have a theory of consciousness and can kind of reinforce that back into the models, uh, and into the technology, that you get to a point where, you know, there's effectively this kind of qualia singularity, this kind of exponential increase in the number of conscious experiences that one can have. Um, and, and, and that's, you know, uh, honestly where I think we're headed. Um, okay.
I'm gonna pause, pause there, but thank you.